everyone please take their seat. I'd like to begin. I think. Uh, good morning. And welcome to Vermont Law School. I'm Elijah Freeman. I'm a first year law student from Bowie, Maryland. Uh, I'm also a member of Vermont Law School's Black Law Student Association. To today's conference will reimagine criminal justice in the 21st century. To begin the event, I'd like to welcome to the podium President and Dean Thomas McHenry, who will begin our giving our opening remarks. Woo! Dean McHenry. Elijah, thank you so much, and uh, welcome everyone. A um, couple of quick administrative uh, announcements. The first is do not hesitate to get up and help yourself to some more cake and coffee during the proceedings. Uh, secondly, if you need to step out to make a phone call or use the restrooms, which are down out to two doors down the hallway, there is a uh, exit sign in the back behind Monica and Rico. Wave your, wave your hands there, over there. And you can go out through that door and then you don't have to make the noise of going through the double doors here. So that's available to you. Um, uh, before I make my introduction, I also want to mention two great announcements about the uh, strength and extent of Vermont Law School. Um, when I uh, became Dean of Vermont Law School two and a half years ago, I said one of my goals was to have a majority on the Supreme Court of the state of Vermont. And that's happened much more quickly than I had expected when Justice Eaton was appointed by Governor Scott to be our new Supreme Court Justice. We now have three justices, a majority, on the Supreme Court of the state of Vermont, which is absolutely wonderful, and we're thrilled um, uh, about that. Um, we're also uh, 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 thrilled to uh, be able to uh, highlight uh, that Ward Goodenough is the new state's attorney for Windsor County. Uh, a position that Professor Bobby Sand held a number of years ago, also a graduate of Vermont Law School. Ward is not only a graduate of Vermont Law School, but his dad, Oliver Goodenough, teaches at Vermont Law School. So we're thrilled about that, and I, I'm, I assume that Ward is equally committed to the principles of criminal justice reform and restorative justice that you'll be talking about today, which is um, so exciting. Uh, you have a great complement of folks who are going to be speaking about these issues, uh, sharing their concerns about the current system. I know we have some non-lawyers in the room and we're thrilled by having the non-lawyers here. You have so much to teach us as lawyers, so don't be shy about um, stepping in and sharing your views with us. Um, you, you know already that criminal justice uh, reform and restorative justice is a, a major concern and part of our curriculum here at Vermont Law School. Uh, we are the only law school in the country that offers a master's degree in restorative justice, and we graduated our very first students last May, Bobby, right? I think it was in May that we had our very first students. We have residential students, we have online students who take their entire master's degree program online and then show up here for graduation. Their first time in South Royalton is the day they graduate, which is a very heartwarming moment for us. Um, and we also have a certificate program, um, which is a uh, smaller number of credits for those interested in learning more about restorative justice. If you have questions about that, Professor Sand or Professor um, Stephanie Clark um, would be happy to talk to you about that. Um, our uh, keynote speakers and our panelists um, share with Professor Sand and Professor Clark an urgency to reshape how crime is both prevented and redressed in the United States. And I was speaking to James from the ACLU earlier as we started, wave your hand, James, if anybody wants to know, talk to you about apparently a criminal justice reform bill that is going through um, our state legislature at the moment. Um, and it's my hope that we will, um, in, in part through our discussions today, spend some time thinking and working on and then acting on how we can um, bring those reforms. So it's a particular pleasure. Uh, I will not have the honor of uh, introducing all the speakers today, but I want to call out a, a, a special note to our Attorney General, um, T.J. Donovan, um, uh, for, uh, and our Deputy Attorney General, uh, Josh Diamond, for being here with us and being so actively involved with our curriculum and with our students, um, many of whom spend uh, a semester up working in the Attorney General's office, which, by the way, is the largest law firm in Vermont, um, which T.J. will probably remind you about. Um, so it's a special treat to have them here, as well as all of you who've, tra some of you have traveled from far away to be with us. So thank you so much. Um, I will now welcome to uh, the podium Beth uh, Awaite from Senator Sanders' office. 
Uh, she works on racial and social justice issues out of the Burlington office, and she has a letter to read to us. So welcome back. Thank you. It's only a few times someone gets my last name correctly, so thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, I'm Beth Whitey, and I'm gonna read a letter from Senator Sanders. It reads, Dear Friends, Thank you for the invitation to attend today's race and the law conference entitled Reimagining Re Criminal Justice in the 21st Century. Congratulations to the members of the Vermont Law School's Black Law Students Association for organizing this conference on one of the most pressing issues facing our country. It is no secret that our criminal justice system is broken. To fix it, we must be ready to address the profound racial inequities that contribute to the over-incarceration of people of color. This means ending racial, racial profiling, training law enforcement to use effective de-escalation measures, re requiring bias training, and ending, and ending mandatory minimum sentences. It means stopping the school to prison pipeline for offer by offering young people higher education, jobs, and opportunities. It also means moving away from a system that criminalizes poverty. And it means ending the failed war on drugs, which has resulted in the disproportionate arrest of African Americans for marijuana possessions. It is absolutely unacceptable that the United States imprisons more of its citizens than any other country on earth. This outrageous level of incarceration is bad for individuals and with a price tag of more than $80 billion each year. It is bad for taxpayers. In fact, the only people who really benefit from this level of mass incarceration is the prison industrial complex, the large corporations profiteering off of people's imprisonment. I believe we must take a hard look at our current policies and their effects to create a system that is more equitable and just. That is why I have introduced legislation to end the money bail system, a system that today means hundreds of thousands of Americans are forced to stay in jail without being convicted of a crime, simply because they cannot afford bail. I have also introduced legislation to decriminalize marijuana and ban both private prisons and detention centers across America. Put simply, I believe real reform means shifting the focus of our criminal justice system from punishment and retribution towards crime prevention, restorative justice, and rehabilitation. Instead of spending money on more prisons, we should invest in our communities by funding our public school systems Insti instituting federal jobs guarantee and ensuring a basic standard of living through decent wages. Please be assured that creating a fair criminal justice system remains one of my top priorities. I appreciate your work and focus on this critical issue and wish you all the best in your education. Sincerely, Bernard Sanders, U.S. Senator. Thank you. Beth, thank you so much for those um, thoughtful comments. I, I was not aware of the actual monetary scale of, uh, of what our incarceration system is costing us. Um, two little administrative announcements before I introduce our next speaker. Um, the first is please silence your cell phones if you haven't done so or put them onto buzz so we don't hear them. And if you need to step out, again, go to the very back uh, behind, behind my, uh, Monica and Rico and you can sneak out that way. The second, if I confuse you, Justice Eaton, and before Professor Sand corrects me, Justice Eaton is on the Supreme Court. Justice Cohen is the new member who is our, uh, our graduate. Um, so it's my deep pleasure to introduce one of my own students who was a, a very thoughtful member of my uh, New Frontiers in Environmental Law and Policy class uh, this past semester. Um, Kyron Williams. Uh, Kyron uh, received his uh, Juris Doctor degree from Vermont Law School last uh, May in 2019. He's now studying uh, to get an LLM degree for your non-lawyers. That's like a master's degree for those who already have their JD degree. He's studying to receive an LLM degree in environmental law. He is a member of our Black Law Students Association, and he's going to give us his opening our opening remarks. Kyron, come on up. Thank you.
Yeah, good morning. Uh, all the info that Damon Henry said, in a short way you could sum that up as, I'm a glutton for punishment. So that's gonna be on my LinkedIn badge, you'll see. Um, I wanna thank you all for coming here today. Um, and it's our hope here as a Black Law Student Association um, that this forum can provide uh, a fundamental way to change how we think about criminal justice policy and reform in this country. And it's really great to have a diverse set of voices here to participate in this forum, and as well as for those who came as, as, as part of the, the audience. So on behalf of BALSA, I wanna thank you for coming. For the panelists, um, we are honored and thank you all for coming and for the faculty and staff who are here who participate with the introductions and all the help. Uh, also, thank you. Um, and before we do that, um, there's a short video that, that we'll show you here um, that helps to kind of provide a, a snapshot of how this problem um, is persistent in this country and how it manifests for a lot of people and just what are some of the issues uh, that are involved when we talk about this massive topic about restorative justice, criminal justice reform, and, and all the other issues that are associated with it. So rather than drag on with my words, I will just go ahead and uh, uh, run a video for you. We turn now to another tragic story about a young man who learned the hard way about the troubles plaguing America's criminal justice system. Khalif Browner was arrested at 16, never convicted of a crime, never had a trial, but spent more than three years in one of the most violent jails in the country. Show Khalif had attempted suicide at least six times, spent 1110 days behind bars, more than 800 of those in solitary confinement. His court date postponed more than 30 times. He endured all this having never been given a trial, never convicted of a crime. A man who served 27 years in prison is now officially exonerated. Governor Cuomo had commuted Felipe Rodriguez's sentence three years ago, but he still carried a murder charge on his record. Yesterday, a Queens County judge dismissed that 1990 conviction for the killing of Maureen McNeil Fernandez. Even simply being accused of a crime is just the beginning of perpetual punishment. A cycle of legalized discrimination, poverty, and reincarceration. A cycle kept in motion by 47,000 laws and regulations nationwide that restrict critical rights and opportunities. After contact with the criminal justice system, millions of Americans are denied employment and housing, denied college educations, excluded from public benefits, separated from their children, deported despite being legal residents, and deprived of the right to vote. These restrictions trap the poor and people of color in invisible cages that extend far beyond prison walls and criminal courts. Cages that lead to a lifetime of obstacles that undermine even the most earnest efforts at rehabilitation and redemption. Cages that send the message, you will never be a part of society again. Depending on where you are and where you live is going to dictate your path through our system. And how you're treated in our system is going to dictate your path in life. Let's be honest about it. And that is why we need a new approach that is governed and guided by restorative justice. Well, what do you think our system is supposed to do? We know what it does, but what is it supposed to do? And if we want to stop harm and change behavior, then that means investing in people and uh, giving them access to services and support, anything that stabilizes their lives so that they can stay in their communities.
And thank you. So I think this video does a good job of kind of framing a lot of the issues that I'm sure that we're going to talk about and address here today. So uh, again, thank you for your attendance. And we'll get to introducing the speakers. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Rico Edwards. I'm currently a 1L here at the law school. I graduated from the Marsh program in 2016. And I had the pleasure of introducing um, Attorney General T.J. Donovan. Um, he's always around here, typically always around the law school or I see him at events. But I really got a chance to meet him um, last summer when I interned um, with his office. Um, and it was pretty interesting. I remember um, being packed in a room full of five other interns. And it was just awesome to kind of just talk about different things going on in the world and the changes that we want to make and the books we want to read from one thinker to another. And I really appreciate that. And so with greater ado, it's, I would like to introduce TJ Donovan. Well, good morning. Good morning. Rico, thank you for that kind introduction and thank you for Letting everybody know at this law school that an internship with the AG's office is, is fun. <laughs> uh, I am happy to be here, uh, but I think after uh, listening to Senator Sanders' remarks and that video, I don't know if I have anything else to say <laughs> uh, other than a feeling of a sense of urgency that we need to do more. And I think that's why we are gathered here today. Uh, but I am happy to be here, and first let me thank Dean McHenry and the entire Vermont Law School for extending the kind invitation to be here uh, to speak with you all today. I want to thank Bobby Sand, uh, my friend and colleague, for reaching out to me. And I want to thank Carla and the Black Law Student Association uh, for the invitation to be here today. When I talk about this issue and when I think about this issue, we can talk about it in an academic manner or we can talk about our own experiences and what we see on the ground. I'm thrilled that my friend Eric Gonzalez, the Brooklyn, New York district attorney is here with us today. We are incredibly lucky to have uh, a public ser servant like district attorney Gonzalez's caliber to be here with us today. Uh, Eric, thank you for being here. Thank you. Eric and I are a member of a group called Fair and Just Prosecution. And we had the opportunity uh, to travel to Germany last May to look at the German uh, prison system. And it is incredibly different than our system. And what underlies it, in my opinion, is respect for human dignity. We went to one jail that was probably a step-down facility, and it looked like one of the nicest apartment buildings in the city of Burlington. There were gardens, there were flowers, I, there may have been a fence, I'm not sure. Uh, the rooms looked more like a, do a dorm room. And here was the amazing thing. I'm not sure I saw one guard. And I'm not sure we saw many prisoners. Because every day, they were allowed to leave, to go to work, to make money, and to be productive, law-abiding citizens in Germany. And the difference of our system is this that long after people get out of jail, we continue to marginalize them, we continue to hold them back, we continue to withhold the opportunity to be what everybody dreams to be, which is that productive person, that creative person, that innovative person to achieve whatever dream he or she may have. And we know that race matters. The numbers don't lie. Nationally, 
and they don't lie in Vermont. So let's talk about Vermont. And I will say this, the difference between being a big city DA and a small state attorney general is this. I said to Eric, I said, how do you get up here today? I, said, I drove, I said, oh, your detail must have given you a ride. The big SUV and security. I said, no, 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 I didn't do that. But when we were coming back from Germany, I was lucky enough to be on Eric's plane and we flew into JFK and of course, I'm carrying my own bags and you gotta go through customs and it was about a three hour wait and let's just say we got VIP treatment with DA Gonzalez and got through customs pretty quickly. So Eric, I owe you one, thank you. Last week, we held an expungement clinic up in Lamoille County. Lamoille County, for those of you who don't know, is a northern county in Vermont, very rural. And it was an amazing day. And many of my criminal prosecutors, for the first time, attended this expungement clinic. And there was a lot of resistance from prosecutors for doing this. And to expunge is exactly what it sounds. It's to erase, to get rid of that criminal record that has held people back for so long, those collateral consequences that attach to that criminal record. And let's be honest about this when we talk about criminal records. They're the most leading document in our criminal justice system because it does go back to where you grow up. Do the police drive up and down your street? It does matter where you go to school and what those policies in terms of suspension and expulsion is. But what truly is probably the greatest injustice is when that sentence is imposed by the judge that no judge or prosecutor ever thought in their wildest imagination this criminal conviction would keep somebody from getting housing, from getting a job, or from simply going on a school field trip with their child. That's what we heard in Lamoille County. It's a young fellow, not a young fellow anymore, who I talked to, and he had two felonies on his record. and it was a grand larceny and burglary. If you're just looking at that piece of paper, which we do in this business, you're saying, this guy's a bad guy. This guy's a bad guy. I said, what'd you do? Because like all prosecutors, I'm just getting that record check. No context about what happened. Just that record check, just that label on somebody that they're a felon. And like most folks who have a criminal record, he was embarrassed, he was ashamed. One of the things that we don't talk about with the criminal justice system is, is that imposition of shame on folks. They internalize it because the community has told them they are not worthy to be part of our community. And we've labeled them as such, as a criminal, as a felon. And he said, well, I did something really stupid. This is 20 years ago. He said, my buddies and I, we got drunk and we broke into our school to play basketball. Sitting there looking at us. I didn't say this to him. In my mind, I'm saying, you were convicted of felonies for that? And for 20 years, I said, well, what, what, he said, well, some, you know, we broke a window, this, that, and, and for 20 years on that act, we have defined that individual as a threat to our public safety. For 20 years, we've taken away his opportunity, his economic opportunity in this state. And then perhaps, even worse, as you fill out this petition, you have to make an argument 
whether or not you have been rehabilitated. And the different standards that we apply to folks in this system, where we've taken away their opportunity to get a job, where we've taken away their opportunity to truly be an engaged member of our community. So I said, well, tell me what you've been doing. I said, well, I've, I haven't been able to get a job because of the record, so I cr started my own business, my own wood woodworking business, and you hear that a lot from folks, that they had to create and start their own business. And I've done that for 13 or 14 years. I've been married for 10. I've been sober for 12, and I'm raising my little sister. Could we pass that standard? Could all of us pass that standard? And the inequality that we impose through our criminal justice system, that marginalization, is through that arbitrary standard, often through that middle class lens of a guy like me. I heard from other folks, mother of three, who said, I just want to be able to go on a field trip with my kids for school. I want to be able to parent. And those collateral consequences that none of us have in, intended have attached and have marginalized folks. And I was happy to sign those petitions to give people an opportunity. And it wasn't about an opportunity, it was much deeper than that. It was that they could truly be a member of our community, to walk out into the community, to help hold their head high, not to have this scarlet letter attached to them, that we've defined them based on perhaps their worst moment of their life. It's inherently unfair and a standard that I couldn't pass or many others couldn't pass. But here was the thing. In spite of it being a great day, in spite of it being, I think, a transfer experience for many members of my office who had never done it. There was not one person of color who showed up for the expungement clinic in Lamoille County. And the question is why? And when we go back to the incarceration rate in our state, we have to be honest that racism exists in this state. You see, Professor Stephanie Seguino here has done tremendous studies about the racial disparities in traffic stops. We're grateful for your work and how it's informed the police. But guess what we don't have data on? What prosecutors do? Because we're the ones who control the case. And our incarceration population should be a reflection of our general population. But it's not. Maybe, and Professor Sweeney will correct my math, as I know she will. That's why I went into law, I was terrible at math. That African American population in the state of Vermont is just below 2%. 8.5% of our corrections population is African American. And then you'll hear in this state, in spite of our open-minded, progressive views, we'll say, well, these folks aren't from here, they're coming from somewhere else. And it's because of our bail laws. And of course, when you look at our bail laws, you're not measuring risk, you're measuring whether it's a risk of flight. And when folks don't have community ties, we impose bail. It's not true, guys. You look, you take out the folks who perhaps didn't grow up here or from here, and still the percentage is 7.9% of African Americans who are incarcerated in Vermont's Department of Corrections. 
And this is our challenge. When we address these issues of race and the law, and we talk about reimagining the criminal justice system in the 21st century. Because what we saw in that video is what plays out every single day in this state and in this country. That justice delayed is truly justice denied. And if you're poor, you're out of luck because we're gonna impose that bail. And again, that middle class lens, a couple hundred bucks, 500 bucks isn't gonna mean a lot to me. But when you can't come up with 50, and we're gonna detain you and we're gonna hold you, guess what? People are gonna make rational decisions and the most rational decision is, I wanna get out of this place. How do they get out? You plead out. That means you take that record. And from a prosecutor's standpoint, it's an easy thing. And you can charge. And I know District Attorney Gonzalez knows this. Here's one of the challenges for prosecutors. It's got to be less an economic, academic exercise and more of a human exercise. I started my career in the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office. It's a great experience for me as a trial lawyer. And I often say everything I learned that I didn't want to do, I learned in Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, I don't know if it's as big as Brooklyn, it may be. Gonzalez is shaking his head, saying, no, nothing, 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 nothing as big as Brooklyn. And as a baby prosecutor, you do a couple things. You do different stints. And one of the, one of the stints you would do, you go into the charging unit. And the charging unit was in this basement, this windowless basement. And there were a group of lawyers in a windowless basement on recurring shifts 24 hours a day. And for those of you who really like law school, it's a perfect job because you're sitting there reading affidavits, issue spotting every day, making charging decisions. But you're not seeing people. And that issue of the implicit bias that we all have, and for a guy who grew up in Burlington, Vermont, in the south end of Burlington, Professor Suguino knows, it's a nice area. Grew up on a street, bottom of my street was a church. Five blocks down was a public school. Other way was a Catholic school, parks, businesses. And then I'm sitting in a basement in Philadelphia, not knowing the community, not knowing the people, reading an affidavit looking for crime. And when it's an academic exercise and not an exercise in humanity, you're gonna get that overcharge. Boy, I can make, this is a felony. This is a felony, I think I can get three out of this one. And all of a sudden, these de minimis acts that in the scope of our public safety and the scale of what's important in the world are amplified by the most dangerous people in the system. A 25-year-old prosecutor with no life experience who's a know-it-all. I'm, I'm a career prosecutor, guys. I, I get it. I've done it. But think about that for a moment. Think if you want to be judged by a person who has no similar life experience as you who's engaged in an academic exercise and doesn't know what it's like to grow up at 17th and Montgomery, D didn't have a church on the bottom of his or her street, didn't have parks, didn't have good schools, didn't have health clinics, didn't have jobs, didn't have grocery stores. 
You start adding those factors in that are never factored in in the criminal justice system, and that's when you start to have the disparate treatment of people based on that charging decision by prosecutors. And when it's that acad academic exercise, and you can overcharge because you can overcharge, and you can ask for bail because you can ask for bail, how does that play out in the courtroom? Let me tell you how it plays out. There's a concept called procedural due process. And I know I'm at a law school with people who are a lot smarter than me, so I'll keep the definition brief. <laughs> but basically, it means that if you feel that you're being treated fairly and you believe in the system that is disposing justice, you are more likely to comply with our laws. And the outcomes actually don't even matter, you, whether it's going to jail or getting the case dismissed. It's were you treated fairly? Were you heard? Did you actually believe in the integrity of the system? So when T.J. Donovan, a kid from the south end of Burlington, representing the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in a district court at 17th of Montgomery, walking through that neighborhood that I'd never experienced before in my life, that was the antithesis to what I knew growing up in Burlington, Vermont, what I viewed as public safety, what I viewed as fairness, what I viewed as right and wrong, boy, that plays out in a dangerous way. <laughs> because that shared humanity, those shared experiences, that empathy, which is so important in our system, doesn't exist. And so those cases at 17 Montgomery are mostly called PUID charges. I thought I was getting the hook for a second. <laughs> How are you? Very well. Good. Uh, okay. Uh, I was on a roll. Um, thank you. The possession with intent to deliver. Quid. And they carried mandatory minimum sentences based on the, the amount. And every single day I'd prosecute these cases. And it was all young African-American men. And every single day, I'd get the files, I'd get the cases, and I'd walk through this neighborhood that was foreign to me, that I didn't understand. I'd do my job. And one day, walking through those, that neighborhood, where I didn't see anything like the community I grew up in. I said to myself, if I grew up here, I might be doing the same thing these guys are doing. We're all products of our environment. And we have to acknowledge the inequality that exists in our community as the cause to the disproportionate representation of people of color in our criminal justice system that the inequality that exists in our community, in our country, is a root cause and is more so perpetuated by the criminal justice system through those criminal convictions and those criminal records that take away people's opportunity. So when we talk about reimagining our criminal justice system in the 21st century, we have to address the issues of inequality in our community. That good public schools matter. That access to affordable health care matters. That neighborhoods matter. That affordable housing matters. That understanding that mental health access and washing away the stigma that applies to that matters. That the opportunity to have jobs matter. And those are investments in our community, not just in prosecutors, police officers, and probation officers. And when prosecutors are serious about public safety, they should be talking about funding early childhood education, creating trauma-informed systems so we understand 
the complexities and the barriers and the obstacles that people face that come into our system to truly make a system that's based on justice, not this distorted view of what public safety means anymore. Because the reality is we have marginalized an entire subset of our population in the name of public safety, and it has not worked. Data. I don't know if Professor Savino's talking today, are you? No. no. Well, you should. <laughs> Professor Savino, as I said, has done tremendous work on traffic stops in our state with police. And it's been good for the police. But what is always left out of the equation is the data of prosecutorial decision. And we need to understand, that is a recommendation on our racial disparities board, is the data collection of prosecutorial decisions. Because those decisions that we're making on that front end by that prosecutor, which is gonna direct people's path, is so important. And we have to do a better job of understanding that decision-making process and managing that decision-making and understanding that that procedural due process concept means this, that we need to have prosecutors and judges that reflect our community. It's not just white guys like me. That we need you, and Vermont has an enormous challenge on the issue of attracting and retaining folks. I know that. I don't know what the answer is, but we gotta do a better job on this. And we stand ready to work with you because the contrast of my experience in Philadelphia is my experience as a prosecutor in Burlington, Vermont. When I was state's attorney and that young kid would come into my courtroom and he might have gotten arrested in trouble for things that I did growing up in Burlington, Vermont, which was mostly drinking beer in the woods. But what do you think I did? When that person came into the courtroom, I recognized them. I understood it. And I could rationalize it. That's our challenge. How do we understand? And there's a real, there is a real argument to go to an evidence-based system to take the arbitrariness out of our charging decisions. Because the numbers don't lie about the disparities that exist in our system, that it should be scientifically based. One of my colleagues used to ask a great question when we were hiring folks for prosecutors. He'd say, have you ever fallen down drunk? Most applicants know how to answer that question. <laughs> and I love that question because that's what you're standing in judgment of as a prosecutor. There's some serious cases, and I have no problem putting in peop people in jail who pose a threat to our public safety. The reality is that's a very small percentage. The vast majority of people are coming in because of addiction, because of mental health, oftentimes a combination of both because of this neighborhood is more strictly enforced than this, that neighborhood. And you see it in Vermont. And so we have to make our systems much more informed on the front end, that we need folks to invest in this state, to be leaders in this state. I had this debate yesterday with a great legal aid lawyer. I said, I want you to come work for us. He said, I don't wanna put people in jail. That's not who I am. I said, there's so much power. There's so much good you can do working as a prosecutor. That it isn't the traditional lock them up and throw away the key. That's not public safety anymore. The public safety is understanding the disparities, understanding the impact that redlining had in our communities and how it played, on, played out through generations of denying people wealth 
and equity and opportunity, understanding the consequences of that conviction that takes away opportunity and having the courage to stand up and say, we got it wrong, that we got it wrong, that everybody deserves an opportunity to achieve whatever they dare or dream of achieving, that this is truly believing in human dignity and human respect and understanding that we all have the potential to do great things, and that the power of the prosecutor, if they can understand that the multiple second chances that I received, I wouldn't be standing here by no stretch of the imagination unless I got about the number's too high, the number of second chances I received in my life. And I understand why I got it, and that's a whole other conversation. How do we pay that forward? How do we recreate our system? How do we believe in the goodness of people? How do we understand and acknowledge and simply say that race does matter, that race, racism is real in Vermont, because it is, and then not be afraid to have the conversation, not be afraid or defensive to say we got it wrong that the numbers don't lie, that none of us believe in these outcomes. But if we don't have the data, we can continue to hide and, and say, well, we're in Vermont. We don't do this. We do do it. It's not intentional. I know that. But it plays out. It plays out. And we got to do a better job. So when we talk about justice reinvestment in this state, bill in the Senate right now that would really transform the back end of our criminal justice system, bring a lot more transparency and due process to folks who are on supervision. It's a good thing. A lot of folks get, we have an incredibly high readmittance rate on furlough violations. But for me, when we talk about reimagining our criminal justice system in the 21st century, it's about expanding what a safe community looks, for, looks like for every single one of us. It means prosecutors and elected officials not talking about whether this piece of evidence is admissible. It's talking about the, in the inequality and the inequities that exist in our communities and understanding that the starting line is not the same for everybody and that we have to level the field for everybody. And that means calling for investments on the front end of our system of healthcare and education and housing and you give people the tools to be successful, and then the best thing prosecutors can do is get the hell out of the way and let people achieve. Thanks for having me, and I look forward to working with all of you.